Hello, thank you for watching our presentation, Leveraging Existing E-Resource Holdings for Textbook Affordability. We hope this video provides information to help you decide if this approach is a viable option for saving students money on course materials at your institution. My name is Katie Miller. I'm the Department Head for Student Learning and Engagement at UCF Libraries. I started with UCF Libraries as Textbook Affordability Librarian. The work spotlighted here started in my previous role of Textbook Affordability Librarian for UCF Libraries. I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Duff, Acquisitions and Collection Assessment Librarian for the University. Although I've transitioned to a new role, Sarah has continued to champion this work. In this video, we will explain how e-resources can support textbook affordability efforts. We will specifically address purchasing ebooks to replace course textbooks. We will outline overall considerations before adopting at your institution based on what we have learned along the way. We will provide the history on how this program started. This wasn't an intentional effort, but a combination of happenstance events that continued to evolve and grow. We will give a primer on evaluating ebooks. And finally, we will share both our success stories and a few cautionary tales based on our experience. We'd like to recognize that library source materials are not the same as an OER. These are ebooks and other electronic resources purchased by UCF libraries and only available to students, faculty, and staff. Although they are not truly open with free access to everyone, they are free to our students, which from our perspective is the most important consideration. Through my outreach efforts on textbook affordability, I encountered a lot of faculty who wanted to provide open materials to students, but the current selection of OER wasn't a good fit for their course. They didn't have the time and energy to create an OER either. In these situations, a library sourced option may be able to bridge the gap. Let's look at a few overall considerations before adopting. As outlined in this flowchart, we actively search for current textbook that can be replaced with a resource from our library. It is vital to confirm with the faculty that they will be teaching the course and using the book for subsequent semesters. They are also the best way to communicate to students that the book is available for free through the library. First and foremost, before undertaking this work, set realistic expectations on what you can accomplish. We did not expect the program to grow as quickly as it did. If your program takes off, do you have the means to support it? Here are some questions to help guide you through the process. Do you have the time and energy to identify eBooks? How much support can you provide to find alternative materials or pull together multiple resources if it isn't replacing the current textbook? How will you support outages, dead links, or other technical issues that may occur? The other part of the equation is faculty involvement in the process. You should expect some faculty to encounter a learning curve regarding usage rights. Many faculty hear about this program and believe it would apply to all books available in a digital format. Although the number of ebook options is growing, be aware that you won't always be able to find a one-to-one -one replacement. Managing expectations on what's available is the reason why we research before reaching out to the faculty. Be pre prepared to explain why a book from Cengage or available on Amazon won't be open to all students to use under a single license. This extends to how the book is shared with students. They may believe they can download the entire book and share it as a PDF instead of directing students to the library link. And finally, be sure the faculty will be proactive in letting students know about the free version and how to access it. My colleague Sarah Duff will now share the history of the program, evaluating resources, and some lessons learned. 
Our collaboration began in earnest when I was making selections from one of our, one of our evidence-based plans. I had the rare opportunity from the publisher to select titles that weren't in our evidence-based pool. So when I reached out to Katie to see what textbooks UCF instructors were using from that publisher. After this, I realized that I should reach out to Katie when making selections from any of our evidence-based plans so that I wouldn't miss any textbooks from forthcoming semesters that might not have high usage yet. From evidence-based selections, we expanded to reviewing all routinely purchased ebook packages, going publisher by publisher against the textbook list to identify assigned texts. This allowed us to grow this program at no additional cost to the library, a major fee. Additionally, we were finding ebooks for textbooks that instructors were already using, so we weren't trying to convince them to change texts. This led to talks and presentations and eventually partnerships that provided funding for additional ebooks. But of course, even with unlimited funding, there are still going to be titles that just aren't available. Not every ebook is going to work as a textbook. There are a few things that we look at when deciding whether or not an ebook is suitable for classroom use. Ideally, we want ebooks to be DRM free for the students. If that's not possible, then we take a look at the class size and determine if there's a suitable user model that will work. Generally speaking, we shy away from single user or three user titles. Students tend to need the textbook at the same time for assignments and readings, so limited users don't really work well unless it's a very small class. We also greatly prefer perpetual access. Titles are sometimes dropped from subscriptions, and there's no guarantee that dropped titles will be available for purchase in a suitable user model. We don't want to lose access to a title during the semester. Ease of use and cost versus benefit are two factors that help us narrow down choices. When an ebook is available on multiple platform, platforms, ease of use is a big consideration. We look for fewer limitations with one-click downloads the best option. When we have external funding, we prioritize the possible ebooks by looking at price per student or number of students reached. Now that we've been doing this for a couple of years, we've learned a few things. Building a structure for ongoing support is absolutely vital. You don't want to reinvent the wheel every semester, so you need to be able to track what you've done and carry it over into the new semester. We've constantly looked for funding, be it end of year funds or partnerships with departments like student government. Since we've been building this and Katie's done more and more outreach, the profile for this project has risen on campus. Of course, it doesn't always go smoothly. Sometimes faculty change their mind after they've submitted their textbook to the bookstore and we end up with outdated information. So it's always good to verify directly with faculty before purchasing an ebook. And sometimes faculty are not as receptive as you might think to this project. Katie encountered one in particular who was not pleased the library purchased a DRM free version for their students because they had authored it. So even though most faculty will be overjoyed, there's always the possibility that things won't go to plan. However, the overall outcome from our efforts has contributed significantly to saving students money on their textbooks. To date, UCF Libraries combined programs and textbook affordability have reached about 35,000 students and saved them over $3 million. Overall, this project has been a major success and there's a lot you can do for textbook affordability without committing any funds or convincing faculty to switch textbooks. Katie and I are always happy to talk about textbook affordability, so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or comments about our presentation.